the Lord. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord let it rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let it rise. begin to praise Him. the land. 
the Lamb for sinners slain. Church said, Praise the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Are you happy in the Lord tonight? Amen. I'm happy in the Lord. Are you expecting? Amen. I'm expecting. I'm expecting on a Wednesday night to receive from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. We're going to take a little bit of time. Have they, the children gone out yet? Are they heading out tonight? They're heading out. All right. All the little kids. All the little kids, you're free to go to your class. God bless them tonight. <laughs> All right, if you found that in your Bible, John 12, say amen. Amen. It's all right to be a little kid. You're all growing up too fast. <laughs> you can just stay right there. You know, the grandma said, that's right. Be sweet and manageable. <laughs> All right, let's stay that way. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but and Lazarus was one of them that sat at table with him. I have heard that some folks have actually set a place setting at the table as a reminder that Jesus is always at the table. Amen. Amen. He's with us every stage of our life, every part of the day. But I believe that when we um, take the time to eat as a family, that we know that his presence is there. And what a privilege it must have been to have had Jesus come and visit their home. I am sure that there was tremendous excitement and preparations were going on to make room for Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we can have him in our hearts and we can have him in our lives. And we can have him at our supper table. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know that God's presence is with us all the time. Jesus was attracted to this household. How many of you want to make your home attractive to Jesus? Amen. We need to make our homes and our churches like this. And I believe the key can be found in Martha and Mary and Lazarus. We need to have the hands of Martha, the heart of Mary, and the mouth of Lazarus. You know that Lazarus was a tremendous witness. And Jesus um, got a lot of glory from the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But you know, there was Martha that was serving behind the scenes, and there, there was the heart of Mary that was the heart of worship. Now they all worshiped and they all served and they all had a testimony, but each one of them specialized in one of those three areas. And I want to have the hands of Martha, 
the heart of Mary, and the mouth of Lazarus. I never want to feel shy or embarrassed or bashful about talking about the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The world certainly isn't shy with their sin, and we need not be shy with our Christ, with our Savior. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, Mary, in the midst of this supper, took a pound of ointment of spikenard, and I've, I've read that it could have been twenty four to $36,000 worth of ointment, very costly. Only the rich could afford such ointment. Obviously, this family was blessed. And Mark 14, three tells us, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at me, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now some believe that this Simon um, could have been the father of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And there is a possibility. There was a Simon that was involved in the priesthood that uh, lost his position. And no doubt uh, it is highly possible that this wealthy family was connected to the high priesthood somehow. We, we, we know from the resurrection of Lazarus that there were a lot of Jews. And obviously they were all Jews, but... When it said the Jews, quite often it's referring to the leadership of the Jews were there. So this was a well-known family and a, and a wealthy family. And uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful that Simon the leper was healed. All right, so he's sitting at me. And, uh, you know, you can read this story in Mark chapter 14. And we're not going to um, uh, go there tonight. But Mary brought that ointment and she broke that box open, which meant one thing that anointing had to be used. Amen. Well, I just want to talk a little bit about brokenness tonight and say that God uses our brokenness to release his anointing through us. And it's, it's a tough lesson sometimes for a new Christian to learn that God can use suffering and disappointments in our lives to actually make us a better channel for his goodness. We would like just to box God up and take him with us wherever we go. But God has other plans for our lives. He wants us not just to be a reservoir holding God's presence, but he wants us to be a channel through which he flows. And I have read the, the characters of many, many people in the scriptures, read about them, and every single one of them had their personal pain that they went through and disappointment. Every single one that God ever used. Joseph was mistreated by his brothers, was sold into slavery. Uh, in slavery, he was faithful and he got, um, he got uh, uh, promoted to a higher position. Then he got false accused. It, it just seemed like his life was a yo-yo until a certain point when God said, okay, enough is enough. You've learned enough. You've grown enough uh, in grace. You've learned to forgive. You've learned not to focus on the negative. Now I'm going to promote you. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some influence, and you're going to be Lord over all Egypt. And what an influence he had. What an influence Joseph had. But God used the brokenness of his life in order to prepare him to be a vessel. Just like that little box of ointment was of no earthly good until it was opened up, and then it could become um, a channel through which this ointment flowed. Now, that's the first point is brokenness. The second point is God wants the anointing to be used in our lives. Amen. Now, the anointing is, let's just back up a little bit and say that in the Bible times, they didn't have a lot of medicines, and most of them were just natural products, what we would call today home remedies. Anybody use any home remedies? No. Yeah, I'm sure you do. There's lots of home remedies. There's products around the home that can be used uh, for, different, for different purposes. And sometimes they work a lot better than the medications that we have to pay for at the pharmacy. And I'm not against uh, a proper prescription when you need it. That's all right. That's the gift of God as well. But home remedies can be used. And anointing oil was used for healing as well um, as oil. Wine was used as well uh, to pour into uh, wounds, to sanitize them, and to help them to heal up and to prevent infection, all these things. So anointing was very uh, associated with healing. Amen. It was also associated with empowerment. The king had the anointing oil poured on his head. And so did the priests and the prophets. They were anointed by God. And it was a symbol, a physical symbol of a spiritual 
uh, anointing that God gives. Now to us, we think of the anointing, we think about the Spirit. Realize that the Spirit of God has come into your life to bring both healing and power. But it's absolutely of no use to you and I, or anybody else in the world for that matter, if we're not a vessel through which God can flow. And God wants to move in this world. How does God want to move? He wants to move through you and I. Now, she began to do some things that seemed very strange. The scripture tells us that she uh, began to anoint his head, and then she anointed his feet. And then she got down on her knees and began to weep over his feet and wash his feet with her tears. And she began to release her long hair. Within those days, women uh, did not wear their hair out loose generally, but they bound it up or, or wore it in a tight braid underneath a veil. Then she undid her hair and allowed that hair to drop to the floor, that beautiful long hair. Now, the strange thing was that the disciples could not appreciate what this woman was doing because they were not in tune with the Lord. Obviously, the Lord appreciated it very much because he said, wherever the gospel is preached, this story is going to be told around all the world. Now, here's the thing. They had really failed. And the guest of the house had failed because he should have taken and anointed Jesus when he came through the door as his guest. He should have had his servant there to wash the feet of Jesus and the disciples. But obviously, these things did not take place. So this woman was more than making up for what the others did not do. Amen. And I want to always give God my, uh, my welcome, Matt. Amen. I want to make the Lord welcome uh, like this woman did. I want to make him welcome every day when I begin that day, when I begin it with prayer and invite the Spirit of God to flow through my life and to make a difference. To invite him to bring healing and empowerment to me and through me to others. Amen. Now, the Bible tells us one of his disciples, verse 4, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, he said... Uh, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, that's 300 days wages in that day. I'm glad we make more than a penny, aren't you? Pennies are almost non-existent now. But in those days, a penny was, that was the day's wages. Why wasn't this? He was thinking very practically. He was thinking, uh, but you know, God looked right past his, his words and saw into his heart. The Bible says in verse 6, this he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear what was put in there. Now Jesus had appointed Judas to be the treasurer for the group. Thank God for faithful people that know how to handle finances and dot the I's and cross the T's. And that's something that I, I will take care of my own, but I really would not want to be the treasurer of a church, honestly. <laughs> I'm thankful for Sister Shelley and others like her that are good, faithful people handling the Lord's money. But Judas was not this way. The Bible says that um, he bare what, what, what was there, what, what was there, in, and sometimes he took and he helped himself. So Judas's first sin did not begin with the betrayal. His first sin became with um, his thievery. But Jesus stood up for this woman and said, "Leave her alone." Let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. Now, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating that this was six days before the Passover when Jesus was going to die on the cross. And you know something? As he stood before Pilate and he stood before Herod, falsely accused by the leadership of the Jews, as he stood before these Gentile Roman leaders, I believe that smell was still upon him. That's that beautiful smell, that fragrance. Even when he was rejected, that fragrance was there. Even when he was falsely accused, even when he was mocked and when he was abused, that fragrance remained. And you know that Jesus is our example. That anointing can enable us to smell sweet even in circumstances where people are misunderstanding us or people are accusing us falsely or people are abusive towards us. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. We do not have to join those who hold bitterness and in their heart against others and unforgiveness, but we can be like Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know something? Nobody can stop God's plan in your life but you. Nobody can stop you from being successful but you. If our attitude is wrong, it doesn't matter what's right in our lives. It doesn't matter how blessed we are. It doesn't matter what privilege we can be like Judas, have the privilege of the most trusted position amongst the disciples and be the treasurer. But if our heart is bitter, if there's, if there's, if there's something wrong in our spirit, we're not going to be blessed. And that's what happened to Judas. And I don't want to, I don't ever want to become like him. I want to keep my spirit right. Amen. Now this woman, uh, Judas, he had a spirit of taking, but this woman had a spirit of giving. She was 
making a great sacrifice upon the Lord. But Jesus was about to make an even greater sacrifice on Calvary. Aren't you thankful that he did? And what this woman was doing was bringing honor to Calvary. She had the spirit of sacrifice. Oh, I want to bring honor to Calvary with my spirit of sacrifice. Why did Mary, the sister of Lazarus, please Jesus? Because she sat at his feet, she heard his word, and she took the time to worship Jesus and to learn. Amen. How many know that when you take time for the Lord and listen to him, and you spend time in his word, you're not just blessing yourself, you're blessing the heart of God. And you cannot bless the heart of God without him blessing. Now, Jesus never took away from the fact that the poor needed to be ministered to. He said at one point in the scriptures, he said, you'll always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. This is her opportunity to minister to me. And Jesus, I believe, repeatedly had his disciples help the poor. Uh, because we know that from the scriptures. Because when, when Judas went out of the betrayal at the Last Supper, he went out to, be, to finish his work, his dastardly work and his hateful work, that the other disciples assumed that Jesus had asked him to take something to the poor. Isn't that something? The heart of Jesus. So giving. And that's what they assumed, but he was out there doing that awful, awful deed. Um, so the Lord would have us to reach out to the poor to help. And, and we will always have opportunities. There are always opportunities. You may not be able to do all that you would like to to be able to help people, but do what you can. Amen? This woman did what she could, and Jesus defended her. He said, you leave her alone. Stop criticizing the rest of you that are sitting back and watching. You should be out there following her example. But instead, he said, you needed an example. She has done this, and she has honored me. And he said, you will have opportunity to minister to the poor. But always put God first. Praise the Lord. Now, um, much people of the Jews therefore knew that Jesus was there. Verse 9. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see this Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Lazarus was a certainly a highlight there. But... Even though many had come to see Lazarus, this woman was making Jesus the center of the meeting. It's all right for us to have good music. It's all right for us to have wonderful programs for our young people. But you know something? Let's always make sure that Jesus is the center of what we do. Amen. Amen? If Jesus is the center, then everything will be in balance. If Jesus is the center, then we will all receive from God what we need. Amen? Amen. And true worship always makes Jesus the center of our meetings. Now the chief priests consulted that they might all put Lazarus unto also to death. Isn't that something? How far a religious spirit can go. They wanted to get rid of Jesus because they saw that the world was turning to Jesus. And they thought, you know what? Also Lazarus is causing more people to turn. We've got to stop this. These chief priests were very wicked men. There is nothing more evil than a religious spirit. Let us pray to God that a religious spirit would never, ever come upon us. Amen? That we would always be full of the Spirit of God and the grace of God and the love of God and the wisdom of God and the power of God. We want these things in our midst. Amen? The Bible says because uh, of reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. You can imagine how upsetting this was to those rulers uh, and on the next day, much people would come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Does anybody know what Hosanna means tonight? What does Hosanna mean? It means save us. They were recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, the one that came into the world to save. Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, uh, other places he's called the Son of David. That's another expression that refers to the king of Israel. Now up to this point, Israel didn't have a king. They were not allowed to have king. They hadn't had kings for centuries at this point in time. There was King Herod, but he was an Edomite. He was not really of Jewish, Jewish lineage. And, and so uh, the people knew that Herod was considered a king, but he was really just an appointee of Rome through which uh, Rome could manipulate the people. But um, now they are proclaiming that Jesus is king. Now that creates a political situation. Now we are not called to um, politicize the things of God. We're not called to um, um, necessarily to promote any particular party. Uh, but we promote the principles of the word of the Lord. And sometimes when we do that, 
we put ourselves in a position where it is a bit tricky because it can turn off some people and excite others as well. Uh, when they declare that Jesus was the king, we think, oh, it's not wonderful. They're receiving it. They're recognizing it. But you know something? It was actually putting Israel in a position of danger because the Romans wanted to be in charge. And they considered Caesar to be the king, along with Herod, who was, again, like a representative of, of his. And Pilate was the governor over, over Judea. And so it was, a, it was really a dangerous position that these believers were in, because to declare that Jesus was the Messiah was really to say, all right, come on, Rome, come down and sick us, <laughs> come after us. And so that's why this happened right at the end of the ministry of Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus from the dead and then him coming into Jerusalem. If that had happened at the beginning of his ministry, it would have been very, very dangerous. It would have really hindered the work that Jesus was doing. Better for Jesus to minister. Uh, he was God incognito. He was God in disguise. Really, he was. And for a long while in his ministry, he never revealed to the people who he was until finally he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And he said, some say John, some say Elijah, some say one of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, which meant the Messiah, the son of the living God. That was a bold statement to make, even for the disciples to have recognized that Peter was the first to speak it out. He might have been the first to recognize, but I suspect that they all were somewhat suspicious that Jesus was a Messiah. I think they believed, but they just weren't absolutely sure, but they knew he was certainly an amazing man. Later on, they discovered that he's more than just a man. He is God. <laughs> In fact, when Jesus calmed the stormy Sea of Galilee, the disciples were about ready to go down for the last time, and and Jesus stands on the bow of the ship and lifts his hand and says, peace, be still. And the Bible says and he immediately, the wind and the wave, waves ceased. And they looked at one another and they said, what manner of man is this? <laughs> what kind of a man? What they were really seeing was the God behind the man. Amen. The God that was operating through the man. So little by little, they began to realize. Now, uh, this was actually fulfilling scripture because in, uh, I believe it's the book of Zechariah, the Bible says that the that king would come meekly riding upon a donkey, not riding on a donkey, not riding on a horse rather, as kings would normally, but riding upon a donkey. And not just a donkey, but an, uh, the Bible says an ass's colt. So this was a young donkey, which obviously was mature, but it was not broken in. And so this donkey was uh, untamed, but when Jesus' presence came upon a donkey, he came right into a place of submission. And that's what ought to happen to us, amen? Uh, they only realized the prophecy had been fulfilled after they looked back. Hindsight is always 20, 20. Uh, but mankind is fulfilling prophecies of the Bible all the time and are unaware of it. You know that politicians are fulfilling prophecies? Bill Gates fulfilled prophecy. This computer system that's taken over, this Windows, it's all part of the of the system. Windows runs practically every computer. Amen. And Apple's may have caught up. I don't know. Does anybody know? I don't know where they stand because there's a lot of apostolic people out there now. <laughs> and I happen to be one of them. It was shiny and got an apple on it. I want it. <laughs> but um, all of these different characters, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, have fulfilled prophecy. And they may not even be believers but God uh, appoints people and gives them uh, skill and ability to invent things and is fulfilling prophecy. Amen. The Bible says that knowledge would be increased and there would be worldwide travel. All of these things are indications that the Lord is coming back. Another thing the Bible said would be an evidence of the second coming of the Lord is in some cases there would be an absence of faith in the world in general, an absence of faith. And you know, it's not hard to to see that because if you look at the majority of population, how many people really uh, take time for God in their lives? We are a slim minority. Amen. But I thank God that there is a, a move of God coming whereby we shall see a lot of people come running to the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's not it's not as rough as it's going to be. Just fasten your seatbelt. Amen. Jesus said, I tell you that he said, when I when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That was a statement he made. Will I find faith on the earth? 
And so it will be a time when there will have been uh, a dramatic uh, downtake in faith, but then God will move in a mighty way as well. Now the people, therefore, verse 17, uh, with Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. So this miracle led to the fulfilling of the prophecy, what we call the triumphal entry, when Jesus rode into um, Jerusalem on a donkey and everybody shouted Hosanna. Now, verse 8, 19 says, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. This is a battle going on. And we're fighting on our side and he's fighting on his side. We're not prevailing. We're not getting ahead. Behold, the world is gone after him. How <laughs> many know that when we fight God, we cannot prevail? Christ was popular because Christ was a servant of all. He was good and he helped people. He was not wrapped up in himself, in his self. He was not self-righteous. He was righteous, but not self-righteous like the leaders of the Jews. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now you wondered, why would Greeks or Gentiles be coming to the feast? Well, there were some who were not born Jewish, but became Jewish, and they were proselytes or converts. And these Greeks were believers or Hellenists, as they were known, and many of them were from uh, Galilee. There was a lot of, of cities there that were uh, had a lot of Greek influence. Now, Greek was pagan. It had all the different gods and goddesses. And so there was some definitely influence. But there were amongst those Greeks people who believed in Jesus. And uh, they came to worship. Uh, now, they were hungry for the Lord. They were hungry for the Lord. In verse 21, the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee. So Philip was from an area that there would have been a lot of Greek people. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Philip is a, is a, a Greek name as well. Uh, he was of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, uh, notice that they didn't go to Andrew and they didn't go to Simon. They didn't go to uh, Simon, um, Simon Peter, but they went to Philip. They went to Philip. They connected with Philip. And you know, people will connect with those that they can relate to. And while we're being a witness for the Lord, let us remember that there are some people that will respond to you that may not respond to your uh, to a sister or to another brother in the church because their personalities, their backgrounds are different. But each one of us needs to be a witness. Amen. We need to be like Lazarus and be a witness for the Lord. And obviously, Philip was doing a pretty good job because they came to him and they said, we want to see Jesus. Philip came and he told Andrew and Andrew and Philip, tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, see, at this point, they're all interested. Is this the Messiah? We're excited. We're, uh, we're enthused about what could happen for Israel. And Jesus said, answered them and said, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I'm going to go down. I'm going to face the cross. I'm going to be buried for three days. I'm going to be resurrected. I will be glorified. But this is not going the way you want it to. I know when you were waving those palm branches, you thought, this is it. It's going to be all victory. Let's throw off the Romans, and God's just going to bless, and we're going to get everything that our heart desires. And, and Jesus is thinking within himself, you have no idea what's about to happen. Your hearts are going to be shattered. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to be torn and broken and bruised and bleeding on the cross. But it's not going to end in disaster. It's going to end in glorification. So whenever he looked forward to the cross, he didn't, he didn't dwell on the shame and the pain, but he dwelt on the glorification. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. Now you know something? We would like to see God's glory too in our midst, but to see a demonstration of the glory of God requires death to himself. Did you know that? Have you noticed since you've been serving the Lord that sometimes you have to die to yourself? How many of you say yes, amen? I cannot always say what I think. I cannot always do what I want. God has to. God has a a, a bridle on my mouth. <laughs> that's a that's an indication that the Spirit of God is in control. The Bible says, "No man can tame the tongue, but the Holy Ghost can." Amen. Amen. And God has to. We can't say everything we think. So He said, "I'm going to give them a piece of my mind," and I'm thinking, "You better hold on to every bit of it that you've got." You better hold on to every bit of your mind that you've got. Don't give them a piece of your mind. Amen. Let's be like Jesus. Jesus said in verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except 
a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Jesus is saying, you want to have a great harvest? But you've got to plant those seeds in the ground. That corn of wheat, that seed has literally got to die. There's life. There's so much potential in that seed for our harvest. But it must die for there to be a harvest. You know there's things that must die within your life or within my life. There's things that must die in order for us to be able to see the harvest. But that's okay, Lord. You had to go to the cross. And I'll go to my cross too. And it's worth it to go to a cross to have a harvest. Revival doesn't come with the cheap price tag. Amen? Amen. It must. We must go down. Sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's dark. Sometimes it feels like we're God forsaken. But you know, a beautiful transformation happens. Not above the soil, but down below the soil. In the darkness. In the loneliness. In the time of misunderstanding in the time when we may feel rejected or we may feel forsaken. It's only just for a short season. We're going to come up out of the ground just like Jesus came out of the tomb. Amen. Like the saying, you cannot keep a good man down. You cannot keep a good woman down. Amen. When we go down and every once in a while in life we do, God's going to bring us back. Amen. And it's going to be with a harvest. Somebody has said, we, it was Billy Colton, we cannot rejoice in the harvest except the corn die. Before the fields can be laden with golden grain, there had to be that great surrender. Amen. That seed has to be broken. It has to almost seem like it's rotting in the soil, but it's really not. What's happening is the outer shell that limits it has to be broken. And then the inner life comes forth. Amen. And that's what happens in our lives. The outer shell of our self-will has to be broken until the life that God's put within us can come forth. Did we lose our signal there for a little bit? But we're back on track, are we? No? no. All right, we'll just... Uh, You're on track. Our recording's okay, though, is it? All right, we'll just upload it that way. After. Now, Jesus said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it in a life eternal. Now, what does Jesus mean here that we are to hate our life? Somebody said, oh, well, that's how I feel all the time. I hate my life. Well, I hope you don't feel that way. That's not what Jesus meant. <laughs> I remember a friend of my daughter, she, <laughs> she needed to learn to smile. She was singing on the platform. And uh, <laughs> something had been said to her once. She didn't realize how she appeared. And, and uh, my, my daughter said to her, she said, well, she said, to be honest with you, she said, you look like you hate your own life. <laughs> It helped her. She was one of those, my daughter's one of those friends, and very kind and caring and encouraging, but she could tell you the truth when you need to hear it too. She said, you look like you hate your life. And well, it made a difference in her. It helped her. It helped her. Well, we're not talking about hating your life in that sense. Um, the scripture will use the expression, um, Esau, uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And really what it means, the word, it's a very strong word, but it doesn't mean that God hated, literally hated Esau. But it's, 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 an, it's what we would call an expression. It means that God so loved Jacob so greatly that in comparison, it was as though he hated Esau. But he didn't hate Esau. God, God loved Esau. God blessed Esau. I mean, Esau, Esau could have had blessings. The problem was that Esau did not value the things of God, and Jacob did. And Jacob had his problems too. But God loved Jacob because he pursued spiritual things. And he valued the things that God valued. And even though both men had their problems, we could say that they were both carnal. They were both sinful. But yet the Bible says that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. It didn't mean that he didn't hate him. It just meant that that love that he had for Jacob was so great. Now you say, well, I don't understand that. I thought God loved everybody equally. We're talking here about relationships. Amen. You love your wife. You love your husband. You love your children. You love them in a way. You may love other people's kids, but in comparison to how you love your children, it's like you hate all the others. It's just so such a vast difference between how you feel towards your children and how you feel and should feel towards your spouse. You love them so much that it's not like I literally hate every other woman I ever dated in my life. You certainly don't feel that way. But in comparison to how I love my wife, it's as though I hate them. And so this is an analogy 
Now, this is a, a comparison in the scripture that we need to understand. We're talking about a different viewpoint. The Middle East viewed things differently. And so this expression, when Jesus said, basically he said, if you, if you love your life, if you love your life so much that you're not willing to do God's will, he said, you're going to lose it. But he said, if you hate your life, or in other words, if you love God so much that in comparison, the love that you have for your own agenda and your own life, in comparison, it's as though you hate yourself. He said, that's the kind of love that God wants. God wants you just to be so in crazy in love with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, obviously, the scripture teaches we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if you don't treat yourself with respect, and you don't love, you have a healthy love and self-esteem, then you're not going to love other people. And sometimes that's what people who are hateful or unkind or difficult to get along with. The real problem is, is they don't like themselves. Amen? Amen? That's that's really, a lot of times people are insecure. That's why they're always bragging and boasting and putting themselves up, putting others down. They're not really secure in who they are. If they were, they wouldn't have to put other people down. Amen? So God wants us to have a right relationship with ourselves. He wants us to love ourselves and then to love our neighbor as ourselves and love God more. And in comparison, our love for God ought to be so great that it's as though we hate it all. Jesus said, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Amen. He said, Jesus is asking for a lot. Yes, he is. But he has every right to ask for us. Because he gave his all for you and I. Amen. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, I started to tell a story on <laughs> Sunday morning. And then the power flickered. And we lost our Facebook. And I came down and I was going to pre preach without a mic for a little bit. And then it came back on. And I totally forgot to tell you the rest of the story. Would you like to hear it? All right, it was about the preacher. How many of you remember that, talking about this preacher? And you wondered, what, why didn't the pastor finish it? Well, I got lost. And I just tried to get back on the train track as quickly as I could. I just, I just got a little further down the track. Well, anyway, this man had, when he first got, when he first came to know the Lord, he just read the Bible and he didn't have a religious background. So he just believed what he read. And Jesus said, in Mark 11, 22 and 24, that um, he that believeth in me, that he'll speak to the mountains and say, mountains be thou removed or be thou cast into the sea. So he thought, wow, that's so amazing. So he went in his room, shut the door, and he said, well, I'll, I'll start with moving a pencil. So he said, okay. He said, I'm focusing on that pencil to try to move that pencil, and nothing happened. So he couldn't figure out why Jesus said you could move a mountain, and he couldn't even move a pencil. Well, we're not talking psychic ability or that kind of spiritism. We're not talking that. But this is just where he was. He had no biblical understanding, but he studied, and he, and he, and he sought to know the Lord, and he built up with uh, this mega church. There were several thousands, and it was very successful. He wrote books, and he was really influencing um, the, uh, the world of churches across denominations and this guy was just so sincere and he gave it all up gave up the big church and he decided that what we need is we need to have personal relationships with other believers and we all need to get on the bandwagon and be ministers we all need to break open our little box and pour out our ointment this is not a spectator thing amen you may be sitting on the chew look on the pew looking at, at the platform here uh, but I'm ministering right now but you know what you're going to be ministering through the week and you could be ministering right while I'm preaching. Um, it doesn't mean that we all have to talk at the same time, but you can amen and you can support and you can pray and you can minister for people, to people during the worship service or the altar service. Amen. We don't come just to be entertained. We come to give of ourselves to the Lord. We come to break open our box and pour out the healing and the power that God has put within us. Amen. Yeah. So anyway, this man saw that somehow this model... People were just becoming like a, it was like a big basketball game. All, this, all the crowds sitting around and watching a few people do all the work. And it, it was entertainment. And so he left it all. And, and he even went to a mission field and packed up and took their family. And, and he had prayed and he had prayed and asked God to perform miracles. And he'd never really seen a miracle happen. But he said he went to this area, he said, and this was a breakthrough for his life. After trying, you know, to just be um, like Jesus and and to exercise the, the authority and the power that the Lord gives us and, and to heal he, and, and being unsuccessful. He was in amongst a people that did not even believe in Christ. 
They were of another religion altogether. And he was ministering to them. And he said, they came up to him for healing. He began to pray for them. He said, and every single person that he prayed for was healed. Every single one that he touched was healed. Blind eyes were opening. Deaf ears were opening. Uh, bodies were straightening. God was doing these amazing things. And, and he was, I just saw this this past week. He was blown away. But I believe that God... God is doing a great work on this man, and he'll no doubt be a, a very influential. He already is influential, but even more more so because uh, I've heard him make statements that that uh, are right out of the book of Acts. Amen. And I believe that uh, he has said, you know, the Bible doesn't say accept the Lord as your personal Savior and you'll be saved. No, he said it says repent and be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've heard him quote that. So I know that God is working on this man. And uh, I believe that each one of us, if we will make ourselves available to God, we will be able to do what Jesus did. Amen. He was the first seed to fall in the ground. Amen. But God can use my disappointments. When I have things that go against me and I'm misunderstood and I'm hurt and I'm, I feel like I'm in the short end of, of things, I just pray, God, whatever you're doing in my life. You know what? It's not going to affect my attitude by the grace of God. I trust and I believe in a God that's bigger than any person, bigger than any organization, bigger than any power, amen, bigger than any decision that can be made that's outside of my hands. I, I might not have the control of the situation, but my God does. And if we serve God and we pursue God, God's going to make a way for us and God's going to use our life. And is there anything else that really matters than God using us? Amen. God wants to. He said he does. Now, Jesus said in verse 27, so we're going to follow him. And if we serve him, he said, my father will honor him. I want the Lord to honor me, don't you? Verse 27, Jesus said, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say, Father? What shall I say? I have an option, he said. Father, save me from this hour? That's a question. But for this cause came I unto this hour. I came to die. I was born to die. But my soul is troubled. Option number one, Father, save me. Sometimes that's the first thing we pray. It's God, save me. Just get me out of this, Lord. Get me out of this. But the second option is in verse 40, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Jesus said, I can pray, save me from this cross, or Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Sometimes I have to go through something personally in order to see them saved. Sometimes it's, it's very difficult, but you know what? If you're praying for God to save them, Fasten your seatbelt because you may go through something too. But trust in God. Now when the people therefore that stood by heard it, some said it thundered and others said an angel spoke to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now we know Satan's been very busy the last 2,000 years since Calvary. But Jesus lets us in on a little spiritual truth here. It's a powerful spiritual truth, actually. It's nothing little about it at all. He said, the judgment of the world took place. When Jesus was on the cross, the judgment of the world fell on Jesus. And he said, the prince of this world, Satan, shall be cast out. Up until that point, Satan had uh, authority, even even amongst people that were the people of God. But when Jesus hung on the cross, and when he uttered those last words, it is finished, the veil was ripped in the temple, and the earth began to shake, the sky was darkened, and, and uh, Jesus said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That was the final battle call and, and the cry of victory. It is finished. It meant the debt was paid. Everything, uh, if you had a mortgage, they would stamp across that those words in the Greek. It is finished. In other words, it is paid. Won't it be great when you own your house? It is finished. What Jesus is saying is that inheritance belongs to us. It's been paid for. And so now, who's got the authority in the world? We do. Jesus said when he left this earth, he said, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world. You're taking me with you. So therefore, as the church, we have all power and authority, not just to do whatever I want, my agenda, but to do the will of God. 
and to fulfill the purpose of God for my life. God has given us authority to do his will. And Satan has been dethroned as far as we are concerned. They say, well, I think he's very active in the world. He is, but in the church, I'm talking about in God's kingdom, because we are not of this world, we're in this world, but the Bible says, not of this world. Amen. The prince of this world is cast out. Satan has been thrown off his throne. Can you say amen? amen? Calvary ruined the devil's authority. The Bible says that through death, Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death that is a devil. The devil is now a defeated foe. The devil belongs under your feet. Hallelujah. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. If I'm crucified, this is going to be the thing that is going to draw all people. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard. We don't understand. We have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. The Messiah will never die. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up, which meant crucified? Who is the Son of Man? We don't understand. You're, you, you, you know, you're the Son of Man. You're the Savior. But you're saying you're going to die on the cross? It doesn't make sense. To them it didn't. But it made perfect sense in light of the Scriptures. Amen? Then Jesus said unto them, verse 35, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light. Lest darkness come upon you. Walk in the light. When God shows you something, you've got a responsibility to walk in that light. Amen. Don't just add it to your arsenal and say, well, now I know more than I did before. No, now you have to do more than what you did before because that knowledge brings a responsibility. He that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Walk in the light. In other words, take action upon what you learn. Every time you learn a spiritual truth, try to apply it to your life. Amen. Walk, take action. If revelation is given to you, truth always takes us somewhere. If when you go to church, the preacher's sermon don't take you somewhere you've never been before, then find another church. Amen? Follow the light or it will go ahead without you. Truth is progressive and you and I must follow the truth. It must be followed to be retained. Amen? The Bible says a pillar of fire had to be watched carefully. Lest it go on without the people. God led his people through the wilderness. A cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. God's people must always walk in the revelation that God gives them. Or well, they will wind up in darkness. Having truth alone is not enough. Jesus said, if we don't walk in the light while we have it, then we'll lose it and we will stumble in the darkness. Verse 36, while you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself. From them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, that's the Greek form of Isaiah, it says Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? Or to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now this is a picture God is saying here, who, who's believing the word of the Lord? Who has seen the power of God, the arm of the Lord? That speaks of his power. In other words, faith must precede a demonstration of the power. Some have not believed, therefore they don't see the power. Those that believe will see the power. The power of God will be revealed to those that believe. That's why some people have miracles all the time. All the time God works little miracles in their life. Because they believe God. Amen. And uh, you can't get a miracle unless you need a miracle. Either too, right? Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes. Why did he blind the, why would God blind somebody's eyes? Why would God harden somebody's hearts so that they don't see with their eyes or understand with their heart and be converted and actually heal them? Because the heart is evil. Amen. We've got to repent. Amen. God can only show truth to people whose heart has been made right. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. Many did believe amongst the leadership of the Jews. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid of being rejected. They believed in Jesus, but they were not quite ready. I believe that after Pentecost, that many of these that were secret believers became open believers. And then the church grew and grew and grew. Amen. 
Why did, why did they, why, why were they afraid to confess Christ? Because verse 43 says they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now everybody enjoys getting a good compliment. Look at your neighbor, say you look nice. And you like, you like to hear that, don't you? <laughs> Some of you are laughing like, I don't believe her. <laughs> we'll take it anyway, even if it's a, even it's a, a compliment under compulsion. We like praise. There's nothing wrong with, with um, uh, you know, appreciating somebody's encouragement. But the problem with them was that they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want God's approval, don't you? Who, which do we prefer, God's approval or man's approval? So Jesus cried and said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me. You think you're believing on me. You're not believing on me, but you're believing on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. How much more plain can you be? Jesus is now revealing his deity, his divinity, his Godhood. He said, he that sees me, this man, sees the God that sent the man. You look at me, you're seeing God in the flesh. And I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father hath sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Amen. As preachers and as saints of God, we need to pray that the Lord will teach us what to say and how to say it. In the NIV, Jesus said, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. What to say and how to say it. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. If we will speak the word of God and will be a witness like Lazarus, if we'll be a worshiper like Mary and have a servant's heart like Martha, we will be blessed. And how many know that much people will be added to the kingdom of God? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful people. Thank you for encouraging us with your presence and feeding us with your word. And we pray that it will find a deep lodging place in our hearts and that you will bless us, keep us safe as we travel and give us a wonderful weekend, Lord. Bless all of our young people in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight.